That's great stuff, Peter. Well, it's what happened, you see. Yeah. <laughs> with Buddy Rich. Now, there's many stories about Buddy, but he was a very difficult man. Boy, he, he was the only drummer in the world, you know. He, he didn't cross with Buddy, but then I got friendly with all the people, the other, the other band down in Florida, and Buddy got jealous. So we got to the point of being a fist fight. And uh, in those days I was afraid of no one. I'd have floored him as soon as, you know. So um, anyway, we got to the point of fisticuffs. And then the, the other uh, guys came in, the club owners, and said, I don't think you know him, Pete. He's just a kid. This <laughs> is in front of Buddy. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I carried on, and then the gig was extended. But just as that happened, uh, some money that I've been waiting for came through, and an order for the recording equipment, which eventually really started off my, my studio, that came through. So I got, so I thought, no, I don't want to do any more with this. So I left, let somebody else do it. <laughs> but. You could be independent in those days because there was plenty of work. You never had to worry, well, where's the next gig come from? There were always gigs, you know. Some out of town and some uh, in New York or, you know, wherever. One time <clears throat> I'd taken this gig up in Toronto and uh, <clears throat> the dr the uh, Drummer in the band, he liked he and I. In the summertime, we used to like to go out into the woods. So we drive out of Toronto, which was much smaller in those days, and we go out into the woods and enjoy it. One, well, we stopped on the way back at a gas station, and there's a car there covered with chicken wire and headlamps all taped up and pile of spare tires and I said, what, what's that? And I heard them talking. The, the guy was on his way to Alaska. And I thought, Alaska? <laughs> that sounds exciting. So I got back to New York and my lady friend then, Pat, she was fed up with her job and the weather was awful. Black rain fell in New York City. And everybody was, I mean, you think the weather's bad here, but you should. So I said, well, what, how would you like to go to Alaska? She's like that. Yeah, so she quit her job. Within a few days, we got the spare tires and all this, and off we went. And what started out on a 12,000 mile trip up to Canada, along the eastern coast, all the way across Canada, the Trans-Canada, highway and then the Alaskan highway as far as Fairbanks. That was a trip of a lifetime and it was wonderful. And nobody would ever think of doing that. Oh, well, did you get paid? No, we just went to see it, you know. And it's, it's um, recently there's been a whole series on Alaska um, that um, we've been watching. And it, it brings it back to me, what it was like. What a wonderful country. And <clears throat> in the summer, wild strawberries. But if you've got a spade and dig, dig down that much permafrost, you know, it's like unbelievable. So anyway, I did, we did that trip. I was away a two and a half months. And I, in the meantime, I'd had this gig with Al Shackman at a place called The Den in the Duane, on Madison Avenue. So, <clears throat> Al held the gig open for me and got a temporary replacement. So when I got back, he said, yes, yeah, it's your gig. So I went right back in. That was a gig which lasted a year. <laughs> Can you imagine that? 
these days, you know. So that was some idea of what used to happen. And then by that time I'd got my recording studio on East Second Street and uh, just north of Houston Street. And I used to get booked for all kinds of recordings. Sometimes I'd play, sometimes I'd just be the recording engineer. And in those days, it was just two tracks. That was all they wanted. In fact, I remember when I did the album with um, Buddy Rich, which was not done in my studio, another studio, and the engineer brought a two-track recorder and uh, Norman Granz said, we don't need two tracks, just a mono. So they wired the two tracks together. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, how naive. And now we look back on it and think how things have developed and changed. It's unbelievable, you know. It was then I started really to, to get into painting. And one day I went out to an art shop and I bought some oils, some pastels, and all the wool necessary. And then I started to drive out to, in the Everglades and just park the car and start painting. And that really started my... I mean, I'd always painted as a kid, and I even done, did some in New York before that, but Florida made it. It was like a, a new career, and I didn't know whether I'd do anything with it. It was just a, I did it with the same heart that I played the music, you know. So when I drove to Alaska with my friend Pat, I took all the art stuff and painted along the way. And it was just marvellous. And I still have some of those paintings now. By 1960. Two, the jazz scene had changed unbelievably. It was the end of the popularity of bebop and all that. And it, the new thing that came in was the twist. Everybody was doing the twist, which they didn't employ bands in it, maybe a piano player, but it was mostly DJs playing the latest rock and roll. So a lot of the work just disappeared. And clubs, when they found all they had to do was to hire a DJ, maybe a piano player, that's all. Then they didn't have to lay out so much money. And that was what, in my opinion, killed the jazz scene as it was then. So the guys were getting older. Bird had already died. A lot of the other musicians just became commercial musicians trying to eat a living, you know. So it was hard. <clears throat> By this time, I'd spent a year in, back in London. That was in 1951. And uh, I got married and my first wife, Barbara, we came back to New York and it wasn't hacking it. And by this time we had a little baby, baby Anna. And uh, I said, well, we've got to do something else. So I said, what do you think about the West Coast? And she didn't really know it, but I'd been out there before. When I went out there before, I'd met the writer Henry Miller and we had a good old confab for a couple of hours. And I knew Big Sur was the place. South of San Francisco, north of Los Angeles, that was where it was happening. So we put everything on in a U-Haul trailer with our Buick. We just took off. And ten days later, we arrived in Big Sur. So that's a new, a new venture, you know. And what I've always done, wisely or unwisely, was to follow what seemed to be it my heart's desire as best as I could, you know, without very much thought of, well, how are we going to survive? And when I got there, we met various friends or people who'd known about us, and um, it was good. But 
How could I earn a living by this time? I got a baby daughter. We we met a wonderful guy. His name was Eduardo Torella, and he was a guy who he was gay. Knew everybody in Hollywood, everybody in New York. I mean, who mentioned everybody? Oh yeah, you know Eduardo, you know, and. Uh, it was Al Shackman who said, you must get in touch with Eduardo. So I phoned and left a message when we came through Los Angeles. And they said, oh, Eduardo's not here, he's probably in Big Sur. So we drove up to Big Sur and he wasn't there and we left a message. And a few days later, this was Morgan's sports car with Eduardo at the wheel and he said, hi, I'm Eduardo, and we became great friends, you know. And, uh, he knew we were looking for a place. Now, if you can imagine, Big Sur, not many houses. In the summer, flocks of tourists. All the help in the uh, cabins and the uh, restaurants, they were struggling for a place to live, so there was no vacant places. But when Eduardo knew, he said, stick with me, he said, I'll, I'm sure I'll find you something. So a few days later, he comes in again, he said, if you want to come with me, meet Deachin. Deachin was this Norwegian guy who built a little Norwegian village, as it were, a series of cabins and a restaurant at um, uh, one of the uh, corners of Invisa. So we went up to see him, we met Deachin, and what was the, there was a scandal going on in Britain at the time called the Profumo scandal. You remember that? And Deacon said, "Yeah, he said, he said yeah, but he said I don't want any Profumo scandal." I said, "No, I don't want be, you know." And we stayed there. We had this little cabin, which was called the Goat House, and it was built to keep goats in, but the goats never arrived, so. He'd rented it out. It was the most primitive place, but it did have electricity and it had running water. And so there was a toilet and a shower. And in the three years that we were there, I put in a, a, a wood stove, two wood stoves, one at one end of the cabin and one at the near end. And I put a, in the in the boiler space, I put pipes uh, which went and heated the water. So then we had hot water. And I kept working on it until after three years it became a real habitable cabin, you know. And so we spent three years there. And I used to cut brass because there's always fire hazards in, the, in California. You, know, you had to keep everything away from the residences because the spark and the whole place would go up. So I did that, played gigs with lots of gigs, and uh, so it was a mixture of gigs. I wrote a book while I was there. We did. We met uh, the English poet Eric Barker, who was a wonderful guy and a wonderful poet. Has never received the acclaim he deserves. He left England years before, and. Uh, it written some poetry books, but uh, this brings me to another point. I'd become by this time aware that it isn't always the people who have the biggest name that are the be best talented. And Eric was one of those, he was, he, he was such a talented poet, and yet here today hardly anybody has heard of him. So, and this reflects the jazz scene, in my opinion. You know, when I played with, say, with Duke Ellington, Duke was, like, known by everybody. But if I'm honest, he wasn't that great. <laughs> you know, there were so many others much better. But Duke had the personality, the flair. <laughs> that was and... So, so often happens, and I see it throughout the arts, whether it's writing, 
whether it's filming, it's all to do with uh, are they known? During the time in Big Sur, Eduardo said, look, he said, they're, they're going to do a film here. We, we'd like you and Al Chapman to be a part of it. And the film was called The Sandpiper. And um, <clears throat> at that time, we knew Kim Novak very well. We were good friends. In fact, Al and Kim were, had a romance. And so then the part was offered to King, Kim, and she was so independent, she didn't want to do that. She turned it down. And one thing you don't do, which she hadn't even realized, and never turn down Hollywood. Once you turn that down, you're finished. And it was her last chance, really. And then she retired more or less after that. But we used to hang out together. <clears throat> we used to get to, in California, vegetables more than a day old were thrown in the skip. So all of us living down there would go down to the skips outside the supermarket and load up and what um, we could eat we, we did and what we couldn't eat we would give to our goat and we had a, a, a Nubian goat which gave us all the milk we needed and that was the way we lived, you know, we just lived off the land virtually and um, anyway, so the Sandpiper movie eventually featured um, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. And Elizabeth Taylor was fine, but Burton was such a big ego. You know, <laughs> anyway, I mean, he's gone now, and so the little ones say, well, you can, you know, you can. But when you see it first hand and you see how these people are so full of themselves, were they that great? And I would much rather have seen Kim do it, you know. But other little anecdotes. One day we borrowed Kim's car. I forget for what reason. And uh, we noticed there was a huge dent in the front mud guard. And, and Al said, shit, we've been in the restaurant or something. And, uh, oh Christ. So we went to the the uh, paint and power place, bought paint, bought filler, knocked out the dent in the mud yard, and spent a day and a half trying to fix this thing. Or maybe she won't notice. So when we returned the car, she said, Oh, you fixed my dent! <laughs> it went these little vignettes of what it was like, you know. I had met Henry Miller, who formerly lived in Big Sur, on, a pre on the Alaska trip on the way back, and had a nice chat with him for a couple of hours, and we talked about various things. And then when we went back to live, he'd moved down to Pacific Palisades in Los Angeles. He'd gotten so bothered by people coming up the trail, Partington Trail, and uh, he said, I can't get on with any writing, you know. He was trying to get a new book finished. So he split to a place where he couldn't be found. So when we first visited, we went up Partington, Partington this Road. If you can imagine, there's like the cliffs 500 feet high, and then the, the highway, and then the shoreline, and then a quarter of a mile out to sea, it's as deep as it, almost it's over a thousand feet deep. So, I mean, it's just a, you know, have a look at Big Sur, if you haven't been there, just have a look at it on the web, see what it's like. So anyway, we drive up this little narrow highway off of the main road, and every house had a sign this big, with an arrow, Miller, 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 all the way up to the top of the party. 
so that nobody would knock on the wrong door, you know. So no wonder he was fed up with it all, you know. And then we met his then wife. I remember she'd been down to the hot springs. That's another thing about being so there was a hot spring. And it, and it was owned by uh, a guy called Mike Murphy, whose grandmother had owned the property. And it was a large house on the edge of a cliff. And there were these hot springs which just used to flow into the ocean. And there were two main springs. One was hot, one was cold. So what they did, they built baths and a channel, and you could channel the water, hot or cold, with a big red, redwood bung. And so, if it got too hot, you, you, you took out the cold plug and let that. And that was the hot, and it was lovely. Well then, when Mike Murphy took it over, he had the idea of getting all these uh, shrinks like people who are very famous in the world of psychiatry and science and all that. And it became known as the Esselin Instru Institute, which still goes today. But then it lost its charm. It, it just became a big commercial scene. And the local people were then forbidden. Unless you actually worked there, you weren't allowed in the hot springs. Whereas it was open to everybody before. And, and, and those are the things that happen. You think, you think, oh, it's beautiful, it's peaceful, but boy, all the shit that goes on with different attitudes and the snobbery, you know. Especially when Al Shackman came over, then we used to hold concerts. Sometimes at the Hot Springs, sometimes at Nepenthe, which was another restaurant, uh, which was just, it started off very uh, low-key, but then it became very fashionable. And I think the event is still there today. Uh, the facets who ran it, they're long since gone. But their son, K. Facet, is very n well known in the fashion world, in weaving and designing and things. And his books are still around. And he was working and developing this at the time we were there, you know. Um, then there was a place called Redwood Lodge, which was like the sort of seedy end of the happy thing. And um, people who ran it, they really didn't know how to run it, and it was a psychiatrist that ran it, but he had no idea what to do, and it was losing money and all that, you know, as often happens. There, and there were various other places that, uh, there was a state park, and that had things going on. I mean, Big Sur is a 50-mile stretch of coast, and uh, you can drive through it and not even realise you've been through it. It's just mountains on the one hand, sections with these huge redwoods, and then the ocean on the other. And then in the winter, you could see the whales jumping out of the water. It's still special, you they, are, they can't spoil that, <laughs> even though they tried, you know. Gradually, California seems ceased to be such a, an attractive... It's beautiful, year-round it's beautiful, but it was like a, so many suits, you know, was, you know, where do you find someone with real... Uh, guts and real conviction. Everybody was being the ultra hip, you know. Anyway, then, as the New York scene folded, first of all, Warren Marsh, his home was in, just outside Los Angeles originally, so he came back to the West Coast. Lee was having problem getting work, so he came out. So then we formed a band which was Lee uh, and uh, Warren uh, and Al Chapman and myself. And we did quite a few gigs, but it didn't have the cohesion that the previous bands had had. I think, too, they were taken with trying to make it, 
and lead it from picking up lettuces in the fields and hated it, obviously, you know. I mean, I, I just sort of knuckled down to cutting brass or whatever work there was. But Lee, that wasn't Lee's scene. Warren was fortunate because his family had money, so he wasn't under the same pressure. So we did a few gigs, but um, it didn't last long. Just uh, sometimes the gigs were in San Francisco, and then gradually the radio station in San Francisco got to know what we were doing. And they asked me to come up and give a, a solo bass recital. So I went into this little studio, not bit, no bigger than yours, stood there with the bass, put the mic in front of it, and I was on here, air, for 45 minutes. As a result of that, University of California at Berkeley, they heard it, can he do a recital for us? So there's all things like that happening, you know. So I go up and just play solo bass. And as far as I'm aware, that was the first time that kind of thing had happened. Bass players were never expected to give solo recitals. Well, who wants to listen to a bass just going boom, boom, boom? <laughs> but anyway, that was, uh, in fact, I put some of that on, on one of our, one of our uh, albums, CDs. And, uh, but the point, I my foot tapping. <laughs> because they didn't know how to mic it up, they just took the mic somewhere down there. So the bass and foot tapping. <laughs> By this time we had the second child, Gretchen. And it was harder to keep things together, make ends meet. And the thought of being, you know, spending the rest of our life struggling. And Barbara being in New York, she didn't want to know that. She said, well, why don't we go back to the UK? which is what we did. And um, we managed to get enough money together. I hired a car to drive back. Most of our belongings we put on a ship, on a cruise ship leaving Los Angeles that would go through the, the Panama Canal and then up to New York. And we were to join it in New York. We didn't have the money to travel on a cruise ship all that way, but we got a regular transatlantic fare from New York. So we put our, drove our belongings down to Los Angeles, put them on the boat, because that was the port of call for the boat, came back, rented a car, put the bases on the roof rack, and drove to New York. And, and so. Ten days later, we're in New York, and that was really the last time I spent any real time in New York. Although Sue and I have since been there and spent time, but that was just as visitors, you know. But in those days, I still felt New York was like a home, you know. So that was the end of our, our Big Sur, California experience.